doing here. He finished a clinical professor of pathology at Stanford and um, Dr. Wong Tseng at the um, Foster Foundation at USSF, but over the last decade also has been uh, helping to see patients with UDIs at Stanford. So she's now going to put it into the principal for diagnosing uh, afterwards and um, examining the uses of UDIs. What do you do? What do you test and so on? Okay, so this course has been going quite a long while, but I still recall when I was sitting here in the lecture in the lecture room, recalling being overwhelmed by uh, all the information I have to get from the patient, you know, and feeling that I won't have enough time during the exam to ask all the questions to the physical exam or the lab, you know, but typically when you're in practice, you're you're allowed the same amount of time to do a uveitis workup as the amount, same amount of time as you take to do like a cataract evaluation. So, you know, people have tried to, to come up with a diagnostic algorithm for uveitis, and it's messy. This algorithm here is for the evaluation of obesity and management of obesity. As you can see, there are branches. It's not a binary algorithm. Problem with trying to develop an algorithm for diagnosing uveitis is that the our input is really uh, unclear, unreliable, and most of you have dealt with electronic health records like Epic, and you know when we put in a diagnosis, we click on the drop-down window. And many times we have to just make compromises in how we want to make a diagnosis. But certainly, electronic health record doesn't include all the medical diagnosis in medicine that we want. And they're still working on trying to improve that. And also, when we try to develop algorithms, you know, the computer you know, it needs to be able to, and to read free text, and that's something where with machine learning, that's going to be coming in the next few years. So when we make a diagnosis of uveitis, you know, how do we label a condition? And I like to categorize the labeling process in two forms. There's a group of uveitic entities where we presume we understand the underlying etiology. So when we name that diagnostic condition, we'll say this is a bacterial uh, coil ulcer, or this is a candida in ophthalmitis, so we have an understanding of the underlying condition. Unfortunately, most of uveitis, we don't know the underlying etiology, and so our diagnosis of uveitis is really descriptive. So we'll say it's uveitic glaucoma, or it's a white dot syndrome. So looking at the first category, what are the underlying etiologies of uveitis? Uh, often I will be asked by patients, what caused my uveitis? And you know, and my simple explanation is your uveitis is triggered by an injury, and that injury can be caused by one of a half a dozen items, and trauma, infection, Masquerade syndrome, which we mean conditions that may mimic uveitis, such as uh, vitreal retinal lymphoma or even a chronic retinal detachment, ischemic process, immune disorders, and drug inflammatory diseases. Now, I have a little mnemonic timid just to remind me uh, to go through these factors in a case for uh, a brand new patient with uveitis, because sometimes I may forget to ask about drugs may, that may induce uveitis, or I may uh, not think of, of some of the masquerade syndromes. 
Now, how do we make a descriptive dinos and uveitis? Well, as clinicians, we like to look for familiar patterns or familiar constellations. And each of these stars that make up the constellation are descriptors that we need to, to find in our workup. So kind of a schematic form of looking at the clinical approach. We look for the, uh, the process, you know, getting a narrative history, look at the symptoms, physical signs, and order lab tests as needed. And we come up with a recognizable constellation or diagnosis. And here's an example that uh, was really described. Uh, narrative history, a 25-year-old man with recurrent uveitis and lower back stiffness, especially in the morning. His symptoms were um, redness, photophobia, and tenderness. And on um, physical exam, he had still a flush, three plus cells, fibrin clot. And we decided because of that to get a lab test and we got an HLB 27 and it was positive. So this is you know, this the formal description for the formal diagnosis of acute anterior uveitis associated with spinal arthropathy, and in this case, it was supported by a positive HIV-27. So when we make a descriptive diagnosis, there are some essential elements we have to include in that descriptive diagnosis. And these are age, ethnicity, whether it's one eye or both eyes, or it alternates from one eye to the other eye. The course was Sanji talked about acute recurrent or chronic, and anatomical location, and pathologic signs that will give us a clue, like granulomas changes, and we'll find, uh, look for associated systemic findings. Now, age is an important factor. In uveitis, we, we, when, it's, when a patient comes in and he's under five, my differential diagnosis is very short, you know. Uh, if it's one eye, I look for an infectious uveitis, and like herpes, and if there's cells in the vitreous, I look for toxoplasmosis, toxic era. There's also the possibility of the HLV 27 uh, associated uveitis if the child's over 10 or 12 years of age. It's rare, it's not seen in two to three year olds. If your young child in front of you has involvement in both eyes, juvenile idiopathic arthritis is the most common form uh, is condition associated with anterior uveitis. Much less common are pediatric sarcoidosis, and that's brought up because it often mimics juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And you should be uh, aware there is a form of pediatric sarcoidosis that is a, almost a dominant inheritance, and that is the Blau uh, uh, Jam syndrome. Tubular interstitial nephritis can occur in kids and adults, uh, but, um, and other conditions, post-infectious uh, uveitis or uveitis that may occur after vaccination and masquerade syndrome. On the other spectrum of age, when I see someone 70 or 80 years old, very much high on my list is a masquerade syndrome. And here's an example of a vitreal retinal lymphoma. You can see that creamy appearance there. Uh, other uh, one that you should consider as well as trippy sauces of dominance. Another factor uh, that you need to look at when you come up with a descriptive diagnosis is the ancestry of patients. And all of us experience in the clinic seeing an Afro-American uh, uh, patient and high on our suspicion list is sarcoidosis, you know. But there are other uh, uveitic conditions uh, that you might ask about the family history or the ancestry. One of them is Bechette's. You know, Bechette's uh, uh, things that follow the, the course of the Silk Road. And Silk Road is a trade route going from China to Greece for, you know, before 100 years BC to about 1500 years BC. And uh, the patients who have this will have the oral ulcers, the uveitis, and many other uh, parts, many other uh, uh, signs and symptoms. 
The other condition that relates to ancestry is Volkoyanai Garada. Now, it's quite often seen in Japan, but in the United States, you would see VKH among the American Indians, particularly in the Cherokee heritage. And it's believed that you know, the genetic uh, uh, predisposition came across a very straight, you know, you know, thousands of years ago. There's another line showing a route south, southward going from Asia into South America. And that may explain why we see VKH among the uh, Latinos, particularly in, in LA. You know. There's been a lot of trade, particularly during the, the Spanish conquistador time, where Spain would bring silk and gold from the Asia to Europe by way of uh, Central and South America. In, in, in terms of another factor in terms of ancestry, it's very important if you see someone who you suspect having acute anterior uvi is associated with HLB 27 is to ask about family history. Very often, there'll be another member of the family, a brother, a father, they'll have a history of you know, back problems or iritis and uveitis. Another factor in treating a uh, descriptive diagnosis is whether it's unilateral or bilateral. When you see a patient with unilateral uveitis, you won't you should think of an infectious cause. And the most common infectious cause of unilateral uveitis that what we can detect and treat is the herpes family of viruses. You know, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, and more recently we, we are seeing cases of CMV anterior uveitis in patients that their immune system are, are competent. You know, it was hard to believe, but and not until we start doing PCR and other diagnostic tests, were we able to find this group, particularly of men from you know, Southeast Asia that develop a hypertensive uveitis uh, that uh, will have unusual KPs on their cornea, and their immune system is seen to be whole and competent. Uh, now, when we see a bilateral case of UVA should trigger you to think about a systemic cause, and that could be an immune-related disease or some widespread infection like TB, syphilis, or Lyme disease. And we talked about, of course, the clinical course, and you have acute, chronic, recurrent, and alternating. Um, alternating triggers, in my mind, HIV-27. In other words, the patient will have the first problem in one eye, then the other eye, or an eye. And I, I click HLIB 27 in red, even your handout, I, there was a typo there. I think I listed HLIB 26. One of the things I will see is uh, a patient that will be re referred in for recurrent anterior uveitis. And the referring doctor would say, well, uh, after I stopped the topical steroids, you know, the patient flared another time. And often they misunderstand that this is really a chronic case. And when you see a patient uh, that has been on topical steroids uh, and stop it, you should expect that the, uh, the patient should not flare for at least four or six weeks before you call it a recurring case. If a patient flares up within four weeks, I usually say this is an undertreated uh, case of uh, uveitis and most likely maybe a chronic case. Now, anatomical location, Sanjay uh, went through it. Uh, the uh, uh, standardized uveitis nomenclature system uh, was a great help before it, uh, it was uh, developed, uh, we had different names for the same type of uveitis. And a lot of that depended on where you, you trained. Uh, if you trained on the East Coast, you might have called intermediate uveitis or peripheral uveal retinitis. If you trained in the Midwest, you might have called it parthenitis. And if you trained 
on the West Coast, you might have called it chronic psychitis. The drawback to the sudden division of anterior and posterior, anterior, intermediate, and posterior is that the, uh, the inflammation of uvea does not really fall into discrete separate divisions of just in the anterior, just the intermediate, or just posterior, posterior. Because inflammation really follows the, the route of the blood vessels. So when you have an inflammation, what, what, what do you see? You really see the response of, of the blood vessels to the tissue injury. So what you see is the leaking of the blood vessels, the swelling of the blood vessels, white blood cells accumulate. So the site of the inflammation is directly related to the course of the blood vessel. And the course of the blood vessels don't neatly fall into the front, middle, and back part of the eye. So this gives you an idea of the schematic version of the blood supply of the mule tract. Now, all you, you know is the ophthalmic artery comes in and divides into three blood vessels, the anterior ciliary, the long posterior ciliary, and the short posterior ciliary. And that's on the outside of the eye, it divides. But when it gets inside the eye, those three blood vessels join together in the uveal tract. The anterior ciliary and the long posterior ciliary form the major arterial circle. And so that's how we get an irritable cyclitis there. Uh, the, where it regards to intermediate uveitis, the long posterior ciliary and the short posterior ciliary anastomose together. And, uh, and uh, the problem we have in, in looking at the, the vascular structure of the uveal tract is that most of what we know comes from latex uh, casts of the, of the uveal tract. It, the latex casts do not show us which direction does the blood flow, particularly when, these, when the blood comes into plexus and various anastomotic connections. So being aware of the vascular anatomy will help with the diagnosis. Here on the left, you can see a transillumination defect because this patient had a uh, iris uh, vessel that became swollen and blocked and you have an ischemic process and atrophy. And this is a case of herpes zoster. Uh, uh, on the far right, you see snow banking. You see the white uh, dots, there are snowballs. And uh, this is a case of parsonitis on it. And the actual uh, inflammation are two parts. You get inflammation in the anterior uveal tract, and you get inflammation of the peripheral retinal blood vessels. On it. Surprisingly, you know, the last time I looked, uh, the uh, histopathological pathological specimens of parsonitis. Uh, there was no inflammation in the pars planus. This is a condition that involves the vitreous base. Uh, <coughs> pathological signs are things that we need to identify to make a descriptive uh, label of uveitis. And uh, the most uh, 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 granulomous inflammation is one that, that's very important. And as you know, granulomatous inflammation is the body's immune system uh, is having difficulty getting rid of uh, triggering agents. It's like these macrophages will consume uh, mycobacterium, spirochetes, and certain viruses and just can't get rid of them. So you end up with a, an inflammatory response which consists of macrophages, epithelocytes, and lymphocytes. Uh, and the condition tends to be chronic. So here's a, a photograph of Mutton's action piece. And again, there is aggregation of macrophages, epithelocytes, and lymphocytes. They vary in size. And what I like to point out is between those round circles, the area appears greasy. Uh, uh, 
One of the things, these uh, accumulations, this, uh, these granulomas inflammations, uh, they have, the collection have different names depending on what part of the eye they're in. So these are lymphatic KPs, but if it's in the iris, you get, we call them kepi and busaca nodules. If it's in the vitreous, we call them snowballs. If they're underneath the retinal pigment epithelium, we call them Dale and Pooch nodules. But it's the same process as granulomatous inflammation. And what causes, <coughs> uh, what should you think about if you have a granulomatous inflammation? You need to think about TB, syphilis, and sarcoidosis. Now, these KPs look different than what you saw before. And it's hard to see, but these are stellate KPs. And stellate KPs get their name because when you look at them with the slit lamp, they have little spicules sticking out. They make, they're called stellate, and some people make it look like dendrit fur. This shape is characteristic of an infectious uveitis. So you will see this in conditions like Fuchs uveitis syndrome. And Fuchs uveitis syndrome seems to be related to a chronic rubella infection. Uh, you see this in herpes. Uh, one thing outstanding about this is that if you draw a line across the cornea, like the equator, you know, going from three to nine o'clock, these KPs are going to be uh, above and below that equator line. And the reason why they're above that is the KPs are targeting infected corneal endothelial cells. Whereas in other forms of uveitis, the KPs are passively deposited on the cornea and the field. You know, we talk about heart triangle with the, a triangle where the base is down, the apex is toward the pupil. Those KPs are passively deposited on the corneal endothelium by the convection currents in the aqueous. This is like dust being blown by, by the wind. Another uh, clue, and, and it's very helpful in making a descriptive diagnosis of uveitis, is the eye pressure. And particularly very high eye pressure, which we call acute hypertensive uveitis. So when you see a patient with cells and flare, they come in with pressures of 30. You have to kind of ask yourself why. Is it because of blockage to the trabecular meshwork, or is the trabecular meshwork the endothelial cells of the trabecular meshwork inflamed and uh, causing obstruction. Uh, so blocking of the trabecular meshwork, you would see an angle closure that would be triggered by peripheral anterior synechi on it. Or you can get blockage of the trabecular meshwork by cell debris. And one example would be in case of lens-induced uveitis, where you have macrophages that have gobbled up uh, pro lens protein that's leaked out from a high mature lens. And these fat macrophages block the trabecular meshwork. There's also a condition called um, Schwartz uh, syndrome. And it's um, Arias Schwartz was practicing uh, in San Mateo just north of us here. And he noticed that patients with chronic retinal attachment, uh, bregmatogenous retinal attachment, would appear with cells, what appears to be cell in the aqueous, and very high pressure. And later on it was learned that what was obstructing the trabecular meshwork were uh, photoreceptor outer segments. So they did tapping the aqueous with electron microscope. They found photoreceptor outer segments that were blocking there. Trabeculitis, uh, occurs when you have an infection of the end of the cells of the trabecular metro. And the big offender is uh, herpes simplex and herpes zoster. It's been suspected that uh, posner schlossman syndrome, glaucoma cyclic crisis, may be due to the hepatic infection. The series done in Japan, where they've done aqueous tap and PCR, a few of those patients have um, positive PCR for her. Toxoplasmosis has also been associated with uh, uveitic glaucoma. 
The mechanism is unclear since toxoplasmosis is a posterior UVX UVA condition. Then it may be the same mechanism as, as Schwartz syndrome where there's outer fullness receptor uh, elements blocking the fecal pressure. And lastly, the steroid induced glaucoma. Now, again, part of this descriptive uh, diagnosis, you have to ask about systemic diseases. And uh, many uveitis specialists will have a paper and pencil list of systemic uh, conditions and they'll have the patient spend you know, 15 minutes or half an hour in the waiting room filling it out, giving their medical history and all that. Uh, in a busy practice, I like to do a, a targeted or focused just review of symptoms. And I have my mnemonic of loggers, which you can see on the end, and loggers is a style of beer. So I'll ask about lung problems, you know, particularly I ask, you know, any breathing problem. I'm looking for sarcoidosis and TB. I'll ask about arthropathies, any ankylosing spot arthritis, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Um, and I'll ask about uh, GI symptoms. I'm looking for conditions like ulcerative colitis, you know, whipple disease, GU, uh, I'll ask about kidney problems. I'm looking at tubular interstitial nephritis. And I'm asking, I ask about sexually transmitted disease. Ears, you know, you know BKH, patients will have tinnitus, you know, uh, Cogan syndrome, hearing loss, RPR, that's, you know, Stanford syphilis. And I'll ask you about skin diseases. If a patient lives in Northern California or Lyme, Connecticut, I'll ask you about you know, tick bites and target lesions as we may discuss. Anchor uveitis is common in rheumatoid uh, rheumatology practice. Uh, you will see patients with uh, ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. You have to recognize that patients just with psoriasis will not develop uveitis. It's a patient with psoriatic arthritis that will. So, uh, I'm going to shift gears quickly. And, uh, so, um, and some of this was given earlier. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that you need to know is drugs that may induce uveitis. And uh, the most likely one you will see on your OCAP exam would be a rip, either rip, ripibutin which is used uh, for the treatment for bacterium avian complex, or you will see one of the drugs used for osteoporosis, like Fosamax or Cydopavir. Uh, one of the more recent reports is that amoxifloxacillin, taken systemically, has been reported because of uh, translumination defects and pigment dis dispersion. The drugs on the bottom, uh, uh, metoprandolol is a beta blocker that has been uh, found to be associated with a granuloma inflammation. It's no longer really used. Uh, and it's questionable how much brain vomiting and the prostaglandin analogs really cause uveitis. Another list that's important for science is uh, HLAD27, excuse me, hypopian. And these are the conditions that are in your handout that should be associated with hypopian. Now, what's the role of laboratory tests? The role of laboratory tests is not to go out and get your diagnosis for you. It's to confirm what your working diagnosis that was developed from your history and physical examination. So casting a wide net, doing non-specific tests, is this gonna raise the cost for the examination is wasteful. And I always believe that in the United States in the healthcare world, we have one bucket of money and we, if one person you know, spends it outrageously, someone else on the healthcare uh, is not gonna, you know, get, you know, anyway. So, uh, so you know, I see often uh, referring doctors to Sedley, C-reactive protein, and ANA in adults, and there really have no value on it. 
depending on your community, uh, you know, you have to ask, you know, should you get uh, testing for syphilis? Uh, definitely if a patient has granulomatous inflammation, uh, I, I always get uh, uh, syphilis testing. Uh, there's some uveitis specialists that everybody who develops eye rider should get syphilis testing. I'm going to see the long here. Yeah, no. The future for laboratory tests is uh, to be able to identify pathogens that cause UVS without the need to isolate and culture an individual species. And what's being done uh, right now at UCF, UCSF is metagenomic deep sequencing. What they're doing is taking samples of agents and vitreous. Uh, they isolate the DNA and RNA in that sample. Then they cause to replicate there. And with the use of computers, they're able to analyze the DNA and RNA sample and match it to a library of DNA and RNA in viruses, fungi, and other infectious agents. And this can be done within a day, and it's, it's been uh, great help in some diagnostic dilemmas. Uh, it's two o'clock now, Juan, you want me to? Oh, uh, yes, uh, about uh, half a dozen. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speed through here. I just want to just say uh, briefly, anterior uveitis. It's the most common form of uveitis you will see. Uh, in a community of 100,000 people, uh, you're gonna, there's going to be 50 new, 52 new cases of anterior uveitis each year. Uh, so the incident rate is about 52 cases there. Uh, the incidence of intermediate is much less and, and posterior is much less than that. Uh, the most common form of anterior uveitis is HLV20, is idiopathic. But then HIV 27 is up there on the list as well as sarcoid and herpes. Uh, uh, the basic laboratory workup is serologic testing for syphilis, as you may decide. If it's granulomatous, quantiferon TV Go has replaced PVD testing. Uh, uh, we often will order an ACE and serum lysozyme if the uh, patient has a granulomatous inflammation. But honestly, you know, the ACE and serum lysozyme are, are really positive, even uh, only if the patient has sarcoid and other organs. You know, the eye is so small, you know, it's, a, it's not enough to trigger a positive ACE and lysozyme. I'll get comprehensive metabolic panels, uh, including kidney and function studies, and a chest x-ray to rule out TB and fungal infections. When you get order HIV 27, you have to understand you, you're ordering a test where 8% of the people walking, healthy people walking down the street are gonna be HIV 27. So you have to compare that with, you know, uh, you know getting a positive result. The other test, uh, uh, specific laboratory test I'll order would be uh, urinary beta 2 microglobin if it's elevated, it's highly suspicious of TNU. For JI pa patients, I'll order ANA. And with fluoritis, I'll, I'll order ANCA. If there's a suspicion of, of infection, you know, I'll get serologic tests for Lyme or Toxel and Toxicura. And if I have a patient with retinitis, we'll get aqueous and vitreous PCR for herpes viruses and Toxel. In terms of treating anterior uveitis, the gold standard is prednisolone masseter. And it's started about every hour or two while awake and it tapers over four to six weeks. Uh, the drug is uh, about $45 for a five ml bottle. Uh, what I've seen more today is many doctors will prescribe Durazol as a first line of drugs. And Durazol is a fluorinated steroid. The disadvantage for me of the Durazol is its cost. 
and many insurance companies will not cover Durazol. So if I write a prescription for Durazol and the patient goes to the pharmacy and doesn't get the prescription and the next day or two days later calls back and they haven't been treated, it's been a major setback on them. But increasingly we're having difficulty getting Durazol. The other disadvantage of Durazol is that it, because it's more potent, it's a fluorinated steroid, it's more likely to cause extremely high, high pressure. Lotomax is a drug that I read, it's also expensive. And I also, I reserve that for cases where I'm having problems with steroid-induced glaucoma from the prenatal masochism. Uh, it's metabolically broken down differently than the other uh, steroids, so it may have an advantage uh, in controlling inflammation, even though it's less potent, but it's less likely to cause high pressure rise. Now, you want to dilate your patients to uh, to prevent adhesions between the iris and the lens. And this, you know, the standard has, in my days has been home atrophy, but increasingly it's been difficult to get dilating drops that you may want to use uh, from the pharmacy because they're, you know, they only so much shelf space on it. So quite often we have to fall back on a cyclogel. I would really like to discourage you from using atropine because it lasts about three or four weeks. And uh, many patients complain about the blurry vision during that time. If topical prenatal acid fails, I'll go to Durazol on it. Uh, if it's an HLG27 positive patient, I may do a perioperative steroid, but often I will use prednisone at one milligram per kilogram. Uh, at high dose and rapid taker and get them off in two or three weeks. And I think that allow the topical steroids to work. So in closing, you know, diagnosing uveitis is fun. It allows you to have some, do some mental exercise and kind of breaks up the humdrum of clinical practice. And the exciting part of uveitis is there's new drugs coming out that allow us to you know, more specifically Three uh, sudden immune elements here. Thank you. Question: How long do you uh, keep someone on prednisolone uh, before you consider it a failed treatment? Oh, uh, three months. Okay. You know, if prednisolone is you know, they don't respond, I'll go to. Uh, one question I often ask is that when do I get concerned about somebody induced cataracts? And you know, before I went into family retirement, I was doing a lot of joint training. And I generally got some experience with all the group, a thousand drops a year. So if I can't get a patient controlled up to less than uh, three times, or if I can only control or four times a day still right year round, I'll go to another form of treatment. About a thousand drops a year so that I can get another spot down. So how can you answer that? That's what I want to see is that you ask questions where you tell you so fully agree that the 90 day time frame, make sure that we reason at the maximum level. So if you have a side that you would call the cell be followed to see when it's a PID, you would not be able to respond. So you should maximize the Thank you.